the study on Exodus. This morning we'll just do it in two parts. Okay, this first part we will look a little bit at the format of this study and then we will look at more of the background questions to uh, the Exodus, who, who, who wrote it, when did it happen and, and, all, and did these type of questions. And we will take a break and then second part of the morning we will look at chapters 1 and 2. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So, Holy Father, we ask you to guide us by your Spirit as we study the book of Exodus. Help us to understand it more. Help us to open our heart to hear what you are stirring in our hearts, what you are calling us to do, so that we may respond to your word and live it. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Saint Moses, lawgiver and prophet, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I firmly believe that if we are going to do Bible study, uh, it makes no sense to me to do any Bible study unless we're going to read the Bible as well. I, I don't mean to give a lot of homework, uh, and there will, not, there, there will not be, but we must at least make the effort to read the text ahead of coming to the session, because unless we are a little bit familiar with what is going to happen in the text itself, then trying to explain the details of it also will go over your head because you are not grounded in, in, in what. So, as I said, the, the first sessions we will use lesser chapters as, as we go, the chapters will increase. Um, so for each week, uh, I will have indicated in the booklet uh, which are the chapters for the next session and, uh, and so that you can read them ahead of the meeting. Now, besides just reading the text and um, coming for the study itself, which is kind of the study part, uh, studying the scriptures, I think, is very important because when we study the scriptures, we become more in touch with what is written, why was it written, and what is the meaning of it. But the meaning when we do Bible study is always generic because it, it, it is looking at the text and is what, what is the author trying to tell us and even deeper, what is God trying to tell us uh, through what the author wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, which is why it is the Word of God. But in order to kind of make it more holistic, uh, I, I think it is also important that we learn to pray with the Scriptures. And we learn to use also the, the text of the Scripture in a way that we reflect on it in the presence of God and in order to hear what is God saying to me through His Word to my life today. Uh, kind of follow the head, heart, hand principle, which is that when we, when we want to grow, we want to grow not just our head. Yes, head is important. We learn things. We know things more. The more we know, the easier it is because then we can apply it to our life. But we also bring it down to the heart. Uh, where does the word of God touch me? What is God's word for me in my life today? And then the hands, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to put it into action? Uh, otherwise, uh, when we only study... And then we will have a big head, but uh, there's, there's nothing we do with it in our lives. So uh, try to be a bit more holistic about it. Okay, so these will be the eight sessions we are doing with the, the chapters, but in your booklet on, on the first page you can find this as well. Okay, so for today, uh, there will be seven parts to today, and we will do... Uh, a to E first and they'll take a break and then we will look at the text itself which is going to be the main point of this morning. Okay, First for the resources of this study, I studied Bible study in, uh, in the seminary in Holland. The Bible I use and will read from is the NRSV ACE, the Anglicanized uh, Catholic edition, uh, but you bring any Bible uh, with you uh, that you feel comfortable with and that is okay for this study. And I may sometimes quote also from another translation, which likely then I will say uh, which translation that is. Uh, other resources I have used for this study is uh, the Come and See Bible study uh, on Moses and the Torah and the Ignatian Catholic Study Bible, which has a lot of notes uh, on Exodus. The New Jerome Bible translation, then Exodus Call to Freedom by Tim Gray and Scott Powell. Um, I have the workbook and I will also watch the video, so I will incorporate their content into the session as well. Uh, one uh, Dutch book and um, 
and also some uh, YouTube Catholic Bible studies by uh, Father Tim Peters, uh, Kirsten from Tilburg, and Deacon Jay Dallas. <music>
you have to understand the, the significance of Moses in the story of the Israelites and their story of redemption. But I'll come, I'll come back to that in a moment. Looking at the structure of the book, uh, you could, uh, in just very simple structure, there's a more detailed structure we can look up, but just keeping it very simple, you can either divide it into two parts or three parts, depending on what measurement you use. So if you divide it based on the theological themes of God great actions, then you will have to divide it that in the first 18 chapters are about God's work of redemption, and 19 to 14 are his work of revelation that all happened at Mount Sinai, in where he gives them the law, where he appears to Moses, where he speaks to him. So his work of redemption from slavery, and then his work of revelation. So you could divide it into two parts based on that. Or if you look more at the geographical movements, then uh, you can divide it into three parts. The first 15 chapters until verse 21 are about the liberation from slavery in Egypt and then the crossing of the sea. Then the start of the desert journey, uh, chapters 15, 22 till, 18, uh, till the end of chapter 18. And then uh, the last chapters, 19 to 40, are again about happen at Mount Sinai where, they, uh, where God makes a covenant with Moses, with his people, and gives them the law. Okay, so that those would be uh, the basic structure of the book of Exodus. We are going to study the book of Exodus itself, which is uh, the story of liberation from Egypt, and then their initial journey into the desert. Exodus is not the end of the story. The story continues throughout Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so the whole story of the Exodus and the desert journey, you, you will have to read also, especially Numbers and, and, and part of Deuteronomy, in order to get a full picture of the story. And then if you want to read the entrance into the Promised Land, then you have to read the book of Joshua. And so the first six books in some way tell you the story uh, of the start of, 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 of the people of God, Noah, Abraham, and then Exodus to uh, Joshua is the story of the Exodus and the entrance of the Promised Land. So there's no entrance of the Promised Land in the book of Exodus itself. Yeah. But I think in, in our thoughts, when we think of the Exodus, the entrance is part of the story. So I just want to point out that the story continues in the subsequent books. So just to make uh, very short remarks about the following stories uh, so that we have a bigger picture. Uh, now Leviticus is very much about laws and the rights of the sacrifice. Because that's why it's called Leviticus, because it's for the Levi priests. How are they to offer the sacrifices? So very much detailed account of how the sacrifices are to happen. The book of Numbers, which is why it's called Numbers, a uh, large part of it are census. Uh, who, who is born of who? Who are the people? Uh, so the first 10 chapters and also the last 11 chapters are mostly census. But a very... Uh, important part of the book of Numbers and, and would be uh, maybe very interesting to read is chapters 11 to 25 because in chapters 11 to 25 of the book of Numbers you have the continuation of the story. Uh, in chapter 13 they will reach the country of Canaan and so they are on the way to Canaan because they stop at Sinai, they settle for a while, they start to build the tent. So a period of about two, three years takes place before they actually reach the promised land. Not because the journey takes so long. If you would have walked straight, if you had enough food and you just walk 40 kilometers a day, you could have reached there much, much faster. But because they settle down for a while, they build a tent and so on, it takes them about three years before they actually reach the promised land. Uh, so do not take the, the mistaken opinion that the journey from Egypt to the Promised Land takes 40 years. It does not take 40 years. Uh, it takes about three years. But they do spend 40 years in the desert. And there's a reason why they spend 40 years in the desert. And that uh, is found uh, in, in Numbers 13 and 14. Because in Numbers 13, Moses sends 12 spies into the land, one from each tribe. And when they come back from the Promised Land, out of those 12 spies, 10 
are discouraging the people to say, oh, we have seen giants, there's no way we can take this land. Uh, they, they are just fear-mongering the people. And because of these 10 spies who are fear-mongering the people, fear gets into the people and they are just not confident anymore that God will give them the land. Only Joshua and Caleb, the two other spies, are saying, this is the land of milk and honey, the land that God has promised us. He will give it to us. Let's go. Yeah. So if the people had listened to Joshua and Caleb, they would not have spent 40 years in the desert. Uh, after three years, they would have entered the promised land. Uh, but because the people grumble and listen to the 10 discouraging spies, God is sending them back into the desert. And so it's not the journey that takes 40 years. They were sent back. And because the spies spent 40 days in the desert, God is sending them back 40 years, uh, a year for each day that the spies spent in the land. They are punished. They are sent back into the desert. Uh, and which means that uh, out of that generation that left Egypt, it is actually the next generation that will enter the promised land. Uh, most of those who have left Egypt uh, will not see the promised land because what is the problem? Egypt is still in them. They're out of Egypt, but Egypt isn't out of them. They, they are still enslaved. They are still thinking the old way. They are still thinking in terms of, of, of being bound, of not free. They have seen so many miracles of God. They, they crossed the Red Sea. And yet, they don't trust God. And so, God is raising a new generation, their children, who don't have the old mindset of Egypt, of slavery anymore, and who will trust God, and they will take the land. Together with Caleb and Joshua especially, who will be the new leader after Moses, because they did trust. And they will see the land, but not the other ten. And, and not that all generations. So that is the story and also why they spent 40 years in the desert. We all know 40 days in the desert. But 40 years is not because it took a 40 years journey to get to the land. 40 years, I think you can walk around the earth. It is because they didn't trust God. And so this is a very important theme that we will have to uh, look at when we read Exodus. This story of do we trust God or do we continue to grumble? We will see that uh, motive over and over again. This, this motive between grumbling and then again God will come in and, and he will provide and, and miracles happen and they trust. And then a little later they will grumble again. Uh, and perhaps... Maybe that's a story of our life as well. Without anyone looking at anyone particular, all of us have a little bit of this grumbling nature in us and, or a lack of trust. Do we really trust God fully? Do we move because He tells us to move? Do we move in His power? And do we trust in His providence? Deuteronomy is mostly a retelling of the story. They are now almost entering the promised land. Moses is at the end of his life. Soon to die, he retells the story to the people. He remembers how the, the Ten Commandments were given, what they were about, and he recalls both the story and the law so that this next generation knows it and can bring it with them, this memory of the story, into the Promised Land. Uh, Moses then, at the last chapter of Deuteronomy, uh, will die. He will not enter the Promised Land because... Uh, there was one moment when he, sh he was supposed to struck a rock and water will come forth, but he struck twice. And, and God uh, was not pleased with that uh, because Moses didn't trust God. Uh, I think for many of us it seems quite harsh. Uh, but uh, to those who is given much, also much will be demanded. And, and Moses is the one person in the Old Testament that is known as the friend of God because he saw God face to face. He, uh, he, he, he had a very intimate connection with God. And so God demanded a lot from him as well. And then Joshua is the story of how then they will enter the land, conquer the land, and divide the land among the 12 tribes. And authorship. So who wrote Exodus? And perhaps a bigger question, who wrote all of the five books of Moses. Now, Exodus, nor any of the other five books, mentions any author, so there is no authorship. It's not like the letters of Paul, where there's a heading uh, to who it is written, and then Paul concludes by his name. No. Uh, so the text itself does not answer the question. Traditionally, it is said that 
the Pentateuch, the Torah, are the five books of Moses, meaning Moses wrote them. And these are the books that Moses wrote. Is that possible? Perhaps, because uh, it is quite clear that Moses was a literate person. He, he did know how to read and write, uh, because he was raised in the courts of Egypt by Pharaoh's daughter. He was given the best scholarly education possible, so uh, at least according to the Egyptian standard. So he surely knew how to read and write. And we see, for example, in Deuteronomy 31, that uh, when given the law, he wrote it down himself. So there are definitely parts of it that were written in the first account by Moses himself. He wrote down the laws that God gave him. Even if Moses wrote most of it, there are surely details that he couldn't have written, like, for example, he could not have written the part about his own death at the end of Deuteronomy. So some parts are added on for sure because he didn't write the account of his own death. And there is a phrase where he says in Numbers 12 that uh, uh, Moses was a very humble man, more than anyone on the face of the earth. Now, I'm not very sure if that is the most humble thing if you write it yourself. So, uh, there are some um, small problems, at least, to Moses having written exactly all. Most scholars, uh, I think especially since the 19th century, hold to another view, which is, is known as the documentary hypothesis, which is that there are four different sources to the five books of Moses. And that these four sources have later been uh, put together in much later years when they are already in the land or even already in exile, and when all of the stories that they know were consolidated from the different sources that came to them. So there would then be the Yahweh source, eh, which is the source that uses the God name. Eh, you can see this in, Exodus, in Genesis and Exodus, where, where sometimes the God name is used, and sometimes God is always referred to as El, eh, which is God. So from that, this hypothesis came that there are two different sources. The source that always uses the God name and the source that never uses the God name. So the Elohim source, which is uh, about a century later. And then the deterministic source from the 7th century BC and the priestly source from the 5th or the 6th century BC. And then later put together. That is the more scholarly opinion uh, on how the book of the five books came together and where their source lies. The Catholic Church has no definitive stance, so there's no, you must believe that this is the way. Uh, there's no definite stance of the Church on the authorship of the five books of Moses. But the Pontifical Biblical uh, Commission in 1906 did conclude that modern tyrannies, uh, meaning the documentary hypothesis, uh, are not sufficiently strong to render the tradition of mosaic authorship unlikely. And in 1948, it confirmed the the influence and role of Moses as both the author and legislator. So the Bible Commission instituted by the Pope does actually favor more the Moses as the author and legislator without having to say that every single detail was written exactly by his hand and we will leave it for what it is and this is just for background. <music>and the historical authenticity. Uh, the date here, I'm not referring to the date of when it was written, but the date as when did the event happen, especially the event of the Exodus. Now, it's quite known, uh, so if, if, if you were to look up uh, online, and, and especially those who would uh, question the historical authenticity will, will point uh, to the fact that in Egyptian history, the event is not known or mentioned. So. Egyptian history itself doesn't tell about the, the Hebrew slaves in their midst and how they then, there were ten plagues and then they left and then uh, Pharaoh and his armies uh, were, were, were drowned in the Red Sea. They don't tell the story. This is, however, not very surprising because among the Pharaohs and the scribes there was a tendency to omit any parts of the story that was not very favorable to them uh, as kings or to the favorable to them as a nation. So there are a lot of missing pieces in Egyptian history because whenever they didn't like the story, they also didn't repeat the story. So it is not uh, strange that they don't tell the story because it wasn't a good story for them. When we read the book of Exodus, we will read about two pharaohs, uh, two pharaoh kings in this time period. Uh, one in the beginning, the one that orders the killing of the baby boys, and at some point he dies, and then his son takes over, 
And uh, so there's two pharaohs in this book. They are not mentioned by name. Uh, so they are not given a name or come back to why, but it gives a little bit of a problem to us then also to find out when is the exact time that this happened. Because if they were given a name, then we will, can go back, okay, this is the time that these pharaohs lived. But because they were unnamed, there are different uh, possibilities of who these two pharaohs then were. If we base it on 1 Kings 6 verse 1, uh, which talks about that 480 years before the building of the Temple of Solomon, the Exodus happened. When the, the Temple of Solomon was built, that one is known in history. We can quite accurately uh, pinpoint to a date when the, the, the Temple of Solomon was built. So going back 480 years, we will come back to 446 BC when the Exodus had to happen based on, on, on that verse. The only uh, one of the questions with that would be is that is this 480 years mentioned an actual number? Is it, is it, is it a, a factual number, meaning it's exactly 480 years, or is it more of a symbolic number? Because 40 is always an important number, uh, 12 is an important number based on the tribes of Israel. So. Uh, 480, you can divide it by 12. So the, the chance that uh, it, it is a symbolic number is also quite real. And so whether we know from that fact that it exactly happened in 1446 BC is a question. There is another uh, way that they have tried to track the date, and this is kind of the more scholarly approach, which is looking at the duration of the kings and the duration of the judges, then you can kind of count backwards and then you must find out when roughly the exodus happened. The only problem with that approach is that uh, the, unlike the kings, the judges, their uh, reigns overlapped. And because the judges, because they were more regional, so there was different judges at the same time, uh, again, uh, it, it, is, it is a little bit difficult to then come up with an exact date. But uh, they will point at around 1280 BC as the time that the exodus must have happened. And if that is the case, then uh, it would have happened during the reign of uh, King Ramses II, uh, the son of Siti I. And so then Siti I and Ramses II would have been the pharaohs of this time. At least the Hollywood movies about the, this, uh, or the Walt Disney movie, uh, they all always portray these two pharaohs in their story. So they like this uh, hypothesis, whether it is exact, we don't know. Uh, we do see in Exodus 1 verse 11 that they were building the storehouses, the store cities of Pitom and Ramesses. Uh, and so it could be that uh, indeed by, uh, they are building it uh, in honor of either the father of city, which was also Ramesses, or the son of city, which is also Ramesses, in honor of their name, um, it could be. We believe the biblical evidence as inspired scriptures. There is no reason for us to believe based on scripture that, oh, this is like a symbolic story or this is a, a parable or something. No, there is no reason why we should not believe that this is a true account of, uh, of what has happened. And in fact, numerous details in the book are difficult to account for if it was written in Israel 100 years later. So if... if it, those who are more skeptical and say maybe it didn't really happen, maybe it's, it is much later invented as a story to encourage the people and kind of come up with a nice story of our origin. Um, well, if that is the case, then that critical thinking would have to account for some difficulties, which is that authentic Egyptian loan works, such as Nile, Reese, Magicians, and so on, are used in the text. As in Exodus, sources from second millennium BC describes Semitic and other foreign slaves uh, conscripted to work in Egypt as field hands and laborers for large construction projects. Uh, so there are other sources that also point at that there were indeed slaves in Egypt working in the field and building the, uh, the big projects. And that also production quarters were set for the brickmasters similarly as we see. So there are certain details that are, uh, we find in other history that are very uh, much in line with what we read in the scriptures. The tent of meeting, the tabernacle, which is like a portable sanctuary, is very much what was also used in the Near East in the time of Moses by other nations. So 
Okay? That also fits both the time and the custom. The book of Exodus is very much acquainted with the local conditions, <coughs> such as the Egyptian agricultural calendar, the use of acacia wood, and so on. And especially this acacia wood is not found in Israel, uh, but it is only found in Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. So there are certain things that very much are in line with what happens in Exodus, and that if it was written hundreds of years later as an invented story, it would have been very hard for them to get all of these details right. So altogether, the story rests on a firm foundation of history, and also, and this is maybe for us as Christians even more important, this story plays a very important role in all of the scriptures, not just in the book of Exodus. So it's not just like something we read in Exodus and then never again we, we see it in scripture. No, the Psalms pray about it. It, it links with the life of Jesus. It, it comes back in, in, throughout Scripture. This story is, is, is referred to over and over again because of its significance. Yeah, and yeah, from the day of the, the Exodus, the Jews celebrate the Passover, and the Passover is celebrated again and again. It is part of their calendar. Jesus celebrates the Passover uh, and, and then institutes the Eucharist. So if all of it was based on a fake story, that would be quite devastating to all of Scripture. And because it's such an important story in all of Scripture, we believe uh, it did happen. How exactly, which, which sea they crossed? That one, yeah, we, we don't know the, the exact location sometimes. Uh, they are different. What route they exact took, we don't know because they mentioned some cities, but where they were exactly located, we also don't know. So there will be many different theories of how they walked, how they traveled, which sea they crossed. Yes, there are questions about that. But that the story happened is not really questioned in Christianity. Looking then at the Christian perspective and also the Jewish perspective. So the Christian perspective is that Jesus is the new Moses. And there are many parallels. I'm not going to even mention them all, but just to mention a few. Both life from birth are threatened by a fearful king. Uh, the Pharaoh trying to kill all of the uh, Jewish boys so that they will not overpower them. Uh, Jesus, by King Herod, he was more targeted. He wanted to kill Jesus, and therefore he killed all uh, those under two years old uh, in the region. Moses is being raised in safety in Pharaoh's house. He was in some way saved by the Pharaoh's daughter, and therefore safely grew up in Pharaoh's house. Jesus he has to flee King Herod, and where does he take refuge? He also takes refuge in Egypt. Moses liberates the people out of slavery of Egypt. Jesus liberates us out of the slavery of sin. The blood of the Lamb saves the Egyptians at the Passover. It is the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, that saves us forever. Uh, Moses gives us the law. Jesus fulfills the law and also preaches us the law. Uh, Moses speaks face to face to God. Jesus prays very intimately to his Father in the Gospels. Moses speaks on behalf of God. Jesus is the revelation of God. He is the Word made flesh and he preaches us the good news. Uh, there are many ways in which Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses. Moses is a type uh, and Jesus is the fulfillment. Uh, so there's a prefiguration there. The Israelites are saved through the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, we are saved through baptism. And in fact, actually, the going through the Red Sea is seen as a baptism. The Passover meal and also the manna, the bread from heaven, both prefigure the Eucharist. The journey to the promised land and the entering into it, including the Sabbath rest, all are a prefiguration of our journey to heaven, the eternal rest, the eternal Sabbath, the fulfillment of the Sabbath and the ultimate promised land. And so there, there's many ways in which this story is very relevant for us as Christians, not just as some kind of historical kind. I mean, yeah, there are some details perhaps in the book of Kings that, yeah, I mean, this particular battle happened. We can find some inspiration there, but how much does it really apply to us? This story obviously applies to us. This is the story of our life. It, it's a spiritual journey. And so that's why I think when we read it, we, we have to read it with eyes of faith. Being amazed by the great miracles that God is doing and how he's liberating his people because this is what he is doing to us as well. For the Jews, it is also a very important story for them eh, because it is the story of how they became a nation, a people. 
who are the Israelites. And, and we will see in the story that the word Hebrews, Israelites, is used time and again in the story of Exodus. So just to clarify also these terms, Hebrews are all the descendants of Abraham. Okay, so after Isaac, uh, because uh, Abraham later on took other wives, uh, he has many more children. And so all the descendants of Abraham are classified as the Hebrews. But from Isaac came Jacob. Then Jacob, after his fight with God, his name was changed into Israel. He has 12 sons. So the 12 sons of Jacob, or the 12 sons of Israel, are the 12 tribes of Israel. So all the descendants of Jacob, through his 12 sons, are known as the Israelites. They will go to the promised land. They will take the promised land. Ten tribes live in the north. Two tribes live in the south. Ultimately, the ten tribes are very quite unfaithful to God. And so they go into exile. Verse, only the south remains, which is Judah. They live near Judea. Uh, they are Judah and Benjamin. But they are known as the, the kingdom of Judah. So they, will be, they are the only ones that remain after the exile. And so if you have any modern day descendant of, of Jacob, they will refer to themselves as the Jews. They will not so much use the word Israelites anymore because Israelites refers to the, all of the tribes. The only remaining nowadays is actually only the two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin. And so they refer to themselves as uh, the Jews. They are part of the southern kingdom, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. This word is not used here in Exodus. Uh, this is from a much later date after the, the divided kingdom. But at least you know now why, why later on in the text we will read sometimes Hebrews, sometimes Israel. They are used quite intermittently because all Israelites are Hebrews. But technically not all Hebrews are Israelites. So the Midianites, for example, are also Hebrews. They are also descendants of Abraham, but they are not Israelites. The descendants of Israel are, are, are the Israelites, are the people of God. But really that they became a nation is really only after the Exodus. Yeah, they, they, they end up in Egypt. They're living there for 400 years. We don't know much of that 400 years. But it is once they pass the, the Red Sea and then they take the, the promised land and when they are given the law, uh, that's when they become a nation. So that's why this is, it, it is such an important story for the Jews because it's in some way the story of their origin. And the origin goes back to Abraham, even to Noah and even to Adam. But they would not have been known as a people unless... The exodus happened unless Moses came into the picture. So it is a very important story of their origin. And like the story of Jesus, Paschal mystery, his death and resurrection, is central to the Christian faith, so the exodus Passover story is central to the Israelites. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, that is the story of our liberation. For the Israelites, the story of their liberation is the story of Exodus. And so it, it plays that same role uh, in Judaism. Uh, what, what the cross of Christ uh, means for us, although the cross of Christ is, of course, more important because it is the fulfillment of the story. Mm -hmm.